All right, now, in Matthew chapter 20, the part of the chapter I want to focus on is the latter part. Um, actually, starting in kind of like verse number 20 is when the mother of James and John approached Jesus Christ, basically asking him if James and John can sit on his right hand and on his left hand in his kingdom. And, um, you know, basically he's saying, well, are you able to be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with and, and to drink of the cup that I'm going to drink of? Like, I, I, can you do all these things? You know, are you worthy? And they're saying, yeah, we can do that. And he says, well, you shall indeed, you know, do all these things. You're going to be martyred. You're going to have these things happen to you. But he says, that's not mine to give. He said, that's not my place to give. And then when the other 10 disciples had heard about this, that they were looking for those two positions, because those are obviously extremely high positions in the kingdom of God to be at the right hand and the left hand of Jesus Christ himself. Very important positions to be at. And they were they had indignation against the two brethren. They were kind of upset. It bothered them saying, well, what, you know, kind of who do you think you are? What do you, you think you're going to get that spot, you know, next to Jesus? And they were kind of upset about it. But Jesus answers them. And see, I don't see a problem with wanting to, you know, earn yourself a lot of rewards and, and have a great position in heaven, except Jesus explains how we need to do that and the mindset that we need to have. And he explains, he says, in verse 25, but Jesus called on him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. He's saying, you know, among the Gentiles, among the world, the princes, the people in power, you know, they have these great positions and, and they, they exercise their authority over other people who have some degree of power and then they, they exercise their authority over others. He's saying, that's not the way that I'm designing the church and that's not the way I want you to work. You know, you don't just get to these powers just to, you know, exercise authority over people. That's not the goal. That's not where your heart should be at. What would... I want you focus on, he says, but it shall not be so among you in verse 26, but whosoever will be great among you, if you want, if you want to be great and do great things for God and you want to have a great name and a great position, he says, whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And a minister is literally, you know, people look at today as a pastor, is just another name for a minister, but the word minister has a lot of meaning and you know, the pastor should be a minister. I believe that because ministering is you're ministering to other people's needs. You're helping other people out. You're, you're coming and, and helping them to succeed in, in whatever problems they're having. You're ministering unto them. And he's saying, look, if you want to be great, then basically what you're doing by ministering another, you're taking the form of the servant. You are not taking that authority, position, role of, of being over people and executing a judgment and authority over other people. You're taking the role of the servant and humbling yourself and doing work and helping other people out. He says, that's how you're going to be great in the kingdom of God. If you, if you want to succeed as a Christian, then you need to be able to humble yourself and do the work of a servant. Be a minister unto others. He says in verse 27, And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. This verse always blows me away. Because here we have the King of Kings and Lord of Lords that has come to this earth. A person, God in the flesh, that deserves all of the accolades, all of the respect, all of the power, all of the authority, everything that you can give Him. And He's saying, that's not why I came. I didn't come for that. He says, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, not for you, to do work for me. That's not why I'm here. I'm not here for you to, to bow down and to wash my feet and to do all this stuff for me. He says, but I came to minister unto you. I came to help you. That's a, that is a huge insight into the God that we have, into the loving God that we have, who cares about us so greatly that, that of all of the, the power and almightiness of, of the Holy One and the just one, the perfect one, to, to say, yeah, no, that's not why I'm here. I'm not here for you to do that to me, but, but I actually came to minister unto you. If anyone was worthy or demanding of that type of respect or position or anything, of course it's Jesus Christ. And we need to remember that when we think of 
the positions that we're striving for in the, in the, the spot that we want to be at. He said, look, I came, you know, and, and one of the reasons he came this way is to be an example for us to follow. And he's saying, this is how I want you to do it. If you want to earn a lot of rewards, if you want to have a great position, if you want to have a great name, then you need to be servant. And what I'm preaching about this morning is this subject, and I'm, I'm applying it mainly to church. And is church a place that you just go to? Or is it you're something that you're a part of? A lot of people go to church. A lot of people will wake up on Sunday morning, they'll get in their car, they'll drive to church, they take what they're being fed, whatever that may be, they're receiving, you know, in, in most of these churches, entertainment by the music, they're, you know, they might talk to a couple friends, and then they go home. That's not the place I want this place to be. If you're here, I hope you're here to be a part of our church. And the church is obviously just a congregation. It's not a building. It's not the place where we physically meet. It's the people. But even understanding that it's the people, how much are you a part of this church? How much do you know about other people in the church? How much are you here to be a servant and a minister unto others? If we're going to do a great work, if we're going to do great things for God, if we're going to try to attain, and, and look, this is my vision. This is what I want to do with this church. I want this church to be well-known among the brethren. I want this church to be known as, as a church that people are doing the work and helping others out and being a servant unto others and leading people to Christ by droves. But we can't do that thinking that we're just going to be sitting in this, this powerful position and people are just going to be looking up to us. We need to get our hands dirty. We need to work and we need to really integrate and be a part of this church and have this church be in one place in one accord. And I know we're not very big right now and I'm not even saying that this is a problem within our church because it's not. I think we have a great church and the people here are very dedicated that come to church. But we need to keep the servant and humble mindset of, of we need a lot of work to do. I'm going to read for you now from some of the opening chapters in the New Testament. And just, just ask yourself a question. When you come to church, do you come to church? Do you come to our services to be served? Do you come here expecting to eat the meals, to you know, have everything handed for you, everything set out, everything is done just for you, and that's what you come to expect? Or do you come with the attitude of, you know, I wonder what I can do for somebody else. I wonder how I can help the church grow and help the church succeed. And I wonder how I can you know, serve God more. I wonder how I can serve other people more. That's the attitude we ought to have. And the apostles had this type of an attitude. In Romans 1.1, it starts off, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. He views himself as a servant. In James 1.1, James, a servant of God. 2 Peter 1.1, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. And in Jude, verse 1, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ. They start off their epistles, they start off their letters saying, look, this is who I am, I'm just a servant of God. I'm his servant. They don't, they don't start off, their letter. look at all the great doctrine, the word of God being transmitted through these men. Through James and Peter and Paul, all these people, great men of God, doing great things for God. Also worthy of, of receiving some respect and some accolades and thinking they've achieved themselves you know, with all the work that they've done, a position for themselves. But every time they open up, they're saying, I'm just a servant of God. I'm a servant of God. I keep that humble attitude. This is what I am. Hey, I'm just here to work, be a worker for God. We need to make sure we don't ever let ourselves get lifted up with pride, which happens oftentimes with knowledge. You start reading the Bible more. You start realizing how nobody else really does read their Bible. You start realizing what a joke most of the churches are when it comes to any type of doctrine, any type of teaching, any type of soul winning, any type of evangelism, anything at all. And people have a tendency to, to get a lofty attitude. And thinking, well, who do you think you're talking to? And who, you know, and just have this type of a mindset instead of the mindset of a servant and saying, you know what, I'm just here to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm here to serve God. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 20. 
Acts chapter 20. Jesus Christ himself came here not to be ministered unto, but to minister unto others. If, we, if he came to do that, we ought to have that same goal and have that same mindset uh, upon other people. Look at Acts chapter 20, verse number 31. The Bible reads, Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said... It is more blessed to give than to receive. And that is a true statement. And if you don't understand that statement, you need to just take it on faith and start doing more for other people. There's lots of things you can fill your days with, especially your days off. Let's say you have a Saturday or something when you're not working and you have a day off. There's a lot of things that you can do with your time. And... It's not a sin to, to enjoy yourself every once in a while and to go and do something fun at all. And so don't take it that way. But if, if you decide to spend your time doing work for other people and helping other people out, you could be like, yeah, but I have all this other work that's not going to be done. I'll tell you what, you're going to feel and understand this verse. It's more blessed to give than to receive when you go and you do work for other people and you can see the progress you've done. You, say, you know what? I might have left some of my stuff go, but when I go and help other people out, you receive a true blessing that, that it's hard to even put into words unless you actually go and help other people out. And Paul said... Um, Who's speaking here in Acts 20? I believe it's Paul. I'm not positive on that. But um, what he's saying here is like, look, you know yourself how I've behaved myself, how these hands have ministered unto my necessities. You know, I've, I've taken care of myself and to them that were with me. And now he's saying, I've showed you these things. I've showed you what it means to work hard. I've shown you what it means to do all this work, to take care of myself and to take care of other people. How that's so laboring, so you doing this work ought to, he says, you, you ought to be supporting the weak. There's people out there that need help that you can be helping. And I gave you the example. I did the hard work to support myself and also to support other people. Now look, this is work. He's saying, I mean, he's talking about laboring. And in order to, to make sure that you're taking care of and other people, you're going to have to step up quite a bit and do a lot of extra work. But this is what the Christian life is about. This is one of the main things, is doing well unto other people and ministering unto others. It's not a cakewalk. It's not, it's not going to be comfortable. And, you know, this church isn't going to be just a comfortable place to come and sit down and just be served and go home. I'm looking for servants, not to serve me, not to just come here and do things for me. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about going and serving other people within the community or even just other people who are in the church, maybe people who are weak. Whoever needs it, we need to go and be the help for them. And I'll help to lead you. But we need workers if we're going to get anything done for God. Look at Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4, we're going to see a great example of a man in the early church named Epaphras. Colossians chapter 4, look at verse number 12. This is, of course, when Paul's just closing up his letter here and, and talking about different people and their greetings unto him. Look at verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayer. So we see here, one of the ways that you can labor for somebody and work is by praying for them, by loving them enough to care about them, to actually pray. 
And anyone who's prayed for an extended period of time knows it is work. It's not easy just to, you know, to get down on your knees and pray for, say, an hour and not get distracted and be able to focus and be able to think about other people and think about their cares and think about their concerns and know them well enough to pray for that person. It says here that Epaphras labored fervently in prayers that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. He's so worried about those other people, the people that he's writing to, and the Thessalonians. He's saying, look, he's been fervently praying for you guys that you can succeed, that you can do well. Verse 13, for I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you and them that are in Laodicea and them in Hierapolis. Here's a man who really cared. He cared how other people were doing. He wasn't with these people in the Thessalonians, yet he was still thinking about them. He was still praying fervently for them, and he cared about them, and he loved them enough to take his time that he can do anything with and dedicate a big portion of his time to praying for them, to going to God and, and asking for God's blessing on them and helping them out in the areas that they, need, they may need need, have need. This is what we need to be doing in our church. We need to have this type of a zeal to serve God and a zeal to serve others, a zeal to be a minister. Who do you have a great zeal for? And I'll tell you, first of all, if you're married, you ought to start off with your spouse. That's going to help your relationship. Make it a point to pray specifically before you even pray for anyone else. Pray for your spouse. Be thinking about them. Be thinking about their needs. You know, oftentimes we go to prayer and it's all me, 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 me. And hey, cast all your cares upon Jesus. I'm, I believe that completely. Yes, go to God with your problems, but don't just pray for yourself. You ought to be thinking about other people. Pray for the needs of your spouse, of your children, of your loved ones, of your church members, of your family members. When you start going through all these people that you ought to be praying for, it's going to take some time. And it's a significant amount of time and we can't overlook that. We need to have that zeal and be willing to put in the work. And you know what? Maybe you say, my day is super packed. Maybe you need to cut out. I mean, sometimes with me, I think the only thing I could cut out is some sleep. Well, so be it. God doesn't want us here just, just lounging about and laying around and not doing any work for him. He wants us getting up. Look, I mean, Jesus Christ is the example. How many nights did he go out into a mountain to pray? He goes out to pray and he sends his disciples, okay, you guys go do this, you go over here, whatever. I'm going to go up here and I'm going to pray. And the Bible records him praying all night long sometimes. Talk about not getting any sleep. And then continuing to go out and to serve and to heal and to, and to preach and to do everything that Jesus was doing and still was making the time to pray. He's our example. And I'll tell you what, you could say, yeah, but he was God in the flesh. Yeah, but he was fully human. Great is the mystery of godliness. Yes, he was God in the flesh, but yes, he had all, all of the, of the ailments of our physical human bodies that we have. He experienced grief and sadness and anxiety and, and tiredness and you know, fatigue, all of that stuff. He had a human body and he did it. And that's why he is the best example to follow. Because when you, you know, you need to be able to find a place where you push yourself, where you can say, you know what, I'm really tired, I'm beat, but I'm going to do just a little bit more. I can do it. I can do a little bit more. Look at what all these other people have done. I can do a little bit more. <clears throat> Turn, if you would, to uh, Ecclesiastes. You know what? No, just go ahead and turn to, turn to Acts chapter 12. So I want the people here to have a vision for this church and have a vision for other people in this church. As people come... And, and get plugged in, you know, there's going to be a lot of growth that needs to take place almost all the time. Very rarely do you, do you get really mature Christians that, that get plugged into a church. Oftentimes, you know, they're already saved or we get them saved. And then there's a lot of growth that needs to happen. There's a lot of learning that needs to happen because most people don't read their Bibles. Most people haven't really learned a lot or they've been going to churches where they're just not really 
expounding on the Bible. And I'll tell you what, when I'm at the door, even when someone gets saved at the door, I try to have a vision for that person, for how they can serve God. I don't look, I try not to look at the outward appearance. I try not to look at, oh man, this guy's all tatted up and all this other stuff and he's got, you know. No. When that person gets saved, man, what things can this person do for Christ? How can this person be a great man of God? or a great lady of God, and start to have that because when you think about people in that way, you're willing to invest in them and say, yeah, you know what? Yeah, they're rough around the edges right now. Yeah, there's a lot of work to be done, but hey, let's get to work. What can I do to help this person out? What can I do to help this person grow to the next level? What can I do to help this person who's never been soul winning before get out and start knocking some doors? What can I do? One of the things you can do is pray, but another thing is getting involved with them, getting to know them, talking to them edifying them. Have a vision for the people in this church. The Bible says in Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. We need to have these goals. We need to have these visions to keep moving forward for yourself, for the church, and for other peoples. For other people. Excuse me. As a team, which is what the church is, the congregation as a group, we're going to be able to get a lot more things done than just individuals. Like that, that guy out soul winning today that who was telling me about? One of, the guys, one of you guys was talking about the, the guy who's beyond church. Oh, yeah. he's, 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 he's achieved this level in his spirituality that he doesn't even need church. Now, he has a testimony that he's saved, Right? But he says that he's just grown beyond church. And what is he doing for God? Nothing. He said he doesn't know any Bible verses. His wife left him, right? He barely sees his own children. But he's beyond church. Yeah, that's what the individual is going to accomplish. When you're just left off to yourself and you're saved and you think you're going to do a great work for God, the guy's doing nothing for the Lord. He can't, he's not even doing anything for his own family, let alone for God. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 4, verse 9, you're in Acts 12, Ecclesiastes 4, 9, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. That guy is a fool because he doesn't understand the importance of church. It's not just about even the learning, which he probably thinks he's lifted up, thinking, well, I know way more than the pastors know. Because that's what a lot of these people who don't want to go to church think. They're like, oh, well, you can't teach me anything because I already know all that stuff, as they don't even crack open their Bibles. But they're not realizing the church is more than just listening to the teaching of, of a pastor. It's a lot more than that. It's a congregation of people who you get to know and people who will be there when you go through hard times. You are there for them to help them through their hard times, but they're there for you, which is why in Ecclesiastes it says, but woe, woe is great sadness to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. There's no one there to help you. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. It's great wisdom from the book of Ecclesiastes. And you know, as our church grows, we should be strengthened by this because we're there for each other to help each other out when people are going down, when people are in bad times, to help lift them up. You're in Acts chapter 12, look at verse number 1. We're going to see some of the power that a strong church has when the entire church is working together and is in one accord and isn't afraid to do the work and isn't just coming to show up and put in their time as a checkbox and then leaving. We're going to see what happens when people actually do the work and they invest time in other people and they care about other people and they pray for other people. Acts 12, verse number 1. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James the brother of John with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. So we see a lot of persecution coming against the church. We see James has already been killed. And then um, Herod sees, oh, the Jews are happy about this. They like this. I'm gaining political favor with them because this guy's been killed. Hey, I'm going to arrest Peter now. So he throws Peter in the jail. But then he waits to do anything until the holidays are over, until Easter is over. 
It says in verse 5, Peter therefore was kept in prison. So he's locked up. Look at this. But prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. This is a great time of need for Peter. He's all by himself. He's locked up in a cell somewhere being guarded by four quaternions of soldiers, which is, I don't know exactly how many a quaternion is, probably four soldiers at least, or four quaternions, whatever. 16, 16 right? Four, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> a little slow. It's been a long day out in the sun. But <laughs> Regardless, it's a, he's got all these soldiers that are keeping him and keeping him bound, right? And... Um, not a very good outlook on a situation. But what does the church do? The church comes together. Now, was it necessarily a church day? No. The church comes together and says, you know what, we're going to pray for Peter. Peter needs our help now. We can't go in and do anything about this, so we're going to pray to God. They couldn't physically go in. I mean, maybe they could have tried to do a jailbreak or something, but you know what? What they chose to do was way more effective because they know and had faith that God is capable of doing all things. And we see here that prayer was made without ceasing of God. Verse number six, and when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. God answered their prayers. The whole church gathers together. They pray, and what happens? Peter is, is, God sends an angel to free Peter from prison. Turn, if you would, to Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah chapter 4, because this stuff, you know, doing this type of work, you say, oh, well, praying is not that hard. Yes, it is. You do it long enough, and you're consistent, and you, and you, and you try to, to make sure that you get a lot of prayer time, and it, it, is, it is difficult. It is going to be uncomfortable. You're going to have to sacrifice something that you do in order to make the time for this type of prayer. We need to make sure that we're not afraid to do the work or that we're not lazy about doing the work, but that we can have the vision and we can see what's going to be possible and we can see the importance of the work that we're doing and the lives that are impacted by it. It's easy to get in the mindset of coming to church and say, oh yeah, I'm supposed to pray, I'm supposed to read, I'm supposed to go sewing, I know that. And, and it's just dull and a drudgery and, and it's just a mind thing that you just know that it's right, but you're not actually acting on it and you're not doing anything about it and you're getting into a lull, into a point where, where you're just kind of complacent. And we need to make sure that we don't let ourselves get complacent about serving God. We need to make sure that we keep ourselves active and keep ourselves working hard. And yes, doing hard work is uncomfortable. It always is. Look at Nehemiah chapter 4, verse number 19. Verse 19, Nehemiah 4, it says, And I said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, The work is great and large, and we are separated upon the wall one from another. Jump back up to verse number 6. They're doing this great work of rebuilding Jerusalem. They're rebuilding the walls. They're rebuilding the city itself. And what they're trying to do is build up these great walls that have been destroyed, that have been brought down to rubble. They've been brought down to stones. And they're trying to do this great work. He says, look, this is a great work. We're trying to accomplish a big thing here. This isn't easy. There's a lot of work to be done. Verse number 6, So built we the wall, and the wall was joined together unto the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. The people's attitudes were right. They had a mind. They said, you know what? We're going to do this work. We're going to be motivated to get our hands dirty, to put in the effort, and to put in the time to do this. That's why the work even got done, is because the people had a mind to work. If you don't have a mind to work, you're not going to get anything done. You need to be able to push yourself. Look at verse 11. It says, And our adversaries said, They shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them and slay them and cause the work to cease. The enemy is always going to be trying to stop the great works for God. When the people have a mind to work, when the people are ready to do this and they're getting their hands dirty and they're working and they're building, 
The enemy's going to see that. And, you know, at first, we went through this story before a few weeks ago. They just try to mock and ridicule you and try to bring your spirits down and say, oh, yeah, ha, ha, you're not going to get that done. You can't do it and be a naysayer about it. And then they realize, oh, wait a minute, they're actually starting to get this work done. It looks like it's actually achievable. And then they come at you even harder trying to get the work to cease. And guaranteed, when you're trying to do a good work for God, we try to do a great work for God. The devil's going to come in and try to and try to interrupt that. He's going to try to discourage you one way or another, whether it comes from a family member or like today with the email that we got. You know, we go out. We had this great group out soul winning today. A lot of people, more than we've had in a while, going out soul winning with us. And what happens? I come back and automatically there's an email. I, I don't want you putting these postcards on the door. I don't want you putting your literature on the door because this is my neighborhood and just go do somewhere else basically is what it said. It's just, we're doing a great work for God and the resistance is going to come. And we need to be able to say, I don't care. I'm not going to listen to the naysayers. I'm not going to let that discourage me. And, and I responded to that, to that message saying, you know what? We, I personally have talked to, multiple, to a few people in the neighborhood that were very thankful for our visit today. And no, you're not going to speak for every single one of your neighbors and tell us we can't do this because we are going to do this. And we need to have that determination Amen. to move forward because what we're doing is right. We need to continue to do this, this job and to make sure that this great work gets done. Now in Nehemiah with the building of the walls, this was a great job and it was a huge task. It was rubble. And they were literally, I mean, the, the, the way they were mocking them, they were saying, yeah, there, these stones are going to try heaping them up together and a fox is going to run over and it's all just going to crumble because of the destructiveness that, was, that they were dealing with, because of the, the great destruction and how much there was just not much to work with. They did this. Turn in Nehemiah chapter 6. They accomplished their goal. Even, in the, even when they had to have one hand with a weapon and one hand with a tool, because the attack was imminent, because they knew that the, you know, the enemy just didn't want this to be done. But even at that point, when they're like, well, they're going to come and, and try, to, try to kill us. We're not going to let the work stop. Even at the point of death threats. What? Okay, well, I guess we'll just be ready to fight while we're working. That was the attitude they had. They had a mind to work. They said, no, we are going to get this job done. No amount of resistance is going to keep us from getting this work done because it's a work of God. And we need to have the same mindset where we are not going to let people back us down. Let the world, let the devil, let anybody back you down on doing a great work for God. Hey, praise the Lord. Two people got saved in our soul winning efforts this afternoon. Praise God for that. What a great thing. What a great work for God. Don't let people discourage you from, from, from talking to people and giving other people the gospel. It's just... We can't do it. In verse uh, 15 of Nehemiah 6 says, So the wall was finished in the 20 and 5th day of the month, Elul, in 50 and 2 days. It only took them 52 days to build up all the walls around the city. That's not a long time. 52 days means they really did have a mind to work. They were working hard. They were putting in all kinds of time to get this project done. It says in verse 16, And it came to pass that when all our enemies heard thereof, and all the heathen that were about us saw these things, they were much cast down in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was wrought of our God. When they finally reached the point of completion, then they could see, yeah, you know, we've faced this resistance the entire time, and now the enemies realize, you know what, God was with them the whole time and that it was foolish for them to even fight against it. Proverbs 18.9 says, He also that is slothful in his work is brother to him that is a great waster. We need to make sure that we're not slothful in our work, that we have this vision for the church and vision for other people, and that we come to church as a servant not to be served. Look at Matthew 14. It's the last place we'll turn tonight. Matthew chapter 14. Life is not all about being comfortable. We have a lot of things in, in, in this life that help us to be comfortable. We have the air conditioning. We have heating systems. We have all kinds of things to make it so that 
we're comfortable. We have tools and machines to do other work for us to make us more comfortable, to make us not have to work as hard. And you know what? I'm not against the AC. I'm not against the tools. I'm not against this other stuff, right? When it comes to all that other work. But when it comes to serving God, there are no shortcuts. There are no easy paths to take. It's all going to make you uncomfortable. It's all work. It's going to make you sweat. It's going to make you tired. You need to recognize that. Be prepared. Go into that knowing, hey, I'm not going to be comfortable. It's going it's to cause strife with people. It may cause family members to, to fight with me. It may cause other people to say nasty things to me. But I'm not going to let that deter me. Because what God has for me to do is more important than what other people think about me or than what other people can do unto me. Matthew 14, look at verse number 22. We see the story of Jesus walking on the water. Matthew 14, 22, And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he, sent, he went up excuse me, into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. So here we see a story, which is a great story. I love the story of Peter, you know, having the courage and finding the, the courage to be able to, to step outside of the boat and come unto Jesus. You see, they saw Jesus walking on the water. Now, it says in verse 24 that the boat, the ship was tossed with the waves. There was a lot of wind, so there's all kinds of waves on the sea. And the ship's being tossed back and forth. And they're on this ship where there's some relative safety in that ship, right? They're in the middle of this wind. I don't know if it's necessarily a storm, but there's at least wind and the, the boat's kind of going back and forth. And that alone isn't very comfortable. So they're going through their life right now with some concerns of their own, probably of their own safety of just, you know, while we're in the ship, it's being tossed around and stuff. And then they see Jesus walking on the water and that scared the daylights out of them. They're just like, what in the world is that? They think it's a spirit. They're like, I mean, I don't blame them. All right. <laughs> I have to say, you know, a lot of times you could look through the Bible and be like, oh, come on. Why did they have that type of an attitude? Oh, they shouldn't have been like that, you know. But if I was on a boat in the middle of a lake and I saw someone walking on the water, I, I mean... I, I can kind of see where they'd be a little freaked out too. Okay, I, I get that. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna give them a hard time about that whatsoever. But um, so Peter sees him, and Peter takes upon himself to say, you know what? Hey, if that's really Jesus, then then you know, tell me that I could come out to you too. And Jesus says, yo, come on out. And because Peter had the courage and the boldness. To, to, to do something that was outside of the realm of, of safety. It's not comfortable. You know, they're already uncomfortable in the boat with, all, with the waves going back and forth. And he says, you know what? But with, because he had the faith in Christ and he knew that Christ was able to do these great things, he saw Jesus out there. He's like, I want to be out there with Jesus. Jesus was out in the midst of the sea, in the middle of all the, the, the turbulence and the waves and the crashing and everything else. But he was just fine. They had their relative safety in the boat, but they were away from Jesus. Peter says, no, I want to be with him. And with that faith, he was able to go out and himself was able to walk on the water. And look, no, no one else besides Jesus is recorded in the Bible as having walked on water. Peter's the only one that gets to say that and, and, and got to experience the the 
just how cool that would be to go out and, and, and go towards Jesus and meet. But look, the, the point is, the point I'm trying to make is that it's not going to be comfortable to do that great work or even to head towards Jesus and to be where he is and to try to do the things that he was doing for other people. He was in the middle of, of, the, of the worst part of it and Peter got off just to go and be with him. And he got off the boat and he was able to, um, to walk in the water until, until you know, a big wave came up and he experienced some fear. Look, we need to make sure we don't have those types of fear because there are going to be a, and you know the wave was just a great facade because Jesus wasn't going to let him get hurt. Jesus was out there in the midst of, of these great huge waves that can be terrifying that you might think, oh man, what happens if this actually topples over me? What's it going to do to me? And Jesus knew what he was doing and he called Peter unto him. Peter should have, and again, I'm not giving him a hard time for this, but he should have been able to realize that uh, you know, if Jesus called him to do that work, to, to come unto him, he says, yes, I, I want you to come here by me, then he could have had the confidence that he's going to make it through because he's doing the will of Jesus. He's doing what Jesus asked him to do. When we're doing a great work, you may have a big wave pop up that looks extremely overwhelming and looks like it's going to knock you down and engulf you and ruin you and destroy you as you start to do a great work, as you start to do the Lord's will. But we need to make sure that we don't have little faith, that we can have great faith. And he says, O thou little faith, wherefore did thou, didst thou doubt? But all he did was he called unto Jesus, and I love how immediately Jesus saves him. Jesus helps him out. Just, I mean, it's not even a pause. It says... Um, when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him. Jesus is there for us. He's our safety net. He's there. We know, hey, look, we're gonna, we need to start going out and doing more for him. And it's going to cause, it may be, it's, it definitely will be uncomfortable. It definitely will be work. But we need to make sure that we're willing to put in the time to serve other people and to, to get out of the boat ourselves. Get out of your comfort zone. If you're, if you're just living your life and you've got your schedule set up and you don't really have much time set apart to, to serve God, you're too comfortable. You need to, to start doing more. And if you feel like I'm just too comfortable, start doing more. You need to start doing more. We, you know, have the vision. Have the vision for your life. Now look, I'm not talking about something that's going to be done even in necessarily 52 days. It depends on, what's, on what we're trying to accomplish. But, you know, the Christian life is a life that's, that spans a lifetime. And it spans years and years and years and years and years. So the little bit that you think you put out, you'd be like, oh, well, this isn't really doing anything. It's doing a lot. Well, I looked at that map today. I haven't looked at the map in a while. I, I shade it off as I kind of get big areas done and I'll fill in multiple streets because I know the areas that we're working on. We've got a lot accomplished. It doesn't happen overnight, but it happens just one day at a time, one week at a time. You just keep plugging away, keep plugging away, keep plugging away. Don't let the naysayers bring you down. Don't let people discourage you, but keep moving forward so that you can end up being a part of a great work for God. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible. We thank you for ministering unto us, dear Lord, of all people. We, it, it amazes me every single time I see that verse, dear Lord. It, it just it strikes me how much you love us and how much you care for us. Lord, I pray that you would help us to have that same type of love for other people the way that you did for us, that we could be ministers unto them, that we can get to know the people in our church, and, and help them out and help those in need, dear Lord. I pray that you would please strengthen us and increase our faith when we are faced with these, with these great obstacles, but that we can be rest assured when we're doing your will that, that you are there. And um, if we're walking in your will, that nothing can hurt us unless you allow it to. And... Um, just take solace and comfort in that, dear Lord. I pray that you please just help us to edify one another, to continue the fight, because sometimes 
when we, when we do the work and we're getting uncomfortable and we get weary, that's when a lot of people want to throw in the towel and call it quits because they get too tired. Lord, help us to be there for each other, to encourage us to just, to just keep doing more and to be able to um, push the, the big goals forward. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.